continuing in James 3. Today we will be looking primarily at verses 2 to 6. The title of the sermon is called Guarding Our Speech, A Measure of Maturity. So let us start in verse 1. We'll read all the way to the end of verse 12 for context. This is the word of the Lord. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is God's holy and inspire where may he add his blessing to it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come now to your word and are eager to hear from you. And Lord, we pray that your word would, would go forth, that it would pierce us to the division of bone and marrow, show us our sins, show us Christ, and help us, Lord, out of love and gratitude to seek to live for him in accordance with your word. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we've all heard the childhood saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. We've probably all said it. And that's a phrase that we say out of good intentions, you know, don't let that get to you, right? But James wants us to know that our words are powerful, that our words have danger to do great damage. And so we need to be able to guard our mouths. We need to guard our tongues. We need to seek to have Controlled because an uncontrolled tongue can produce great damage. Just to remind ourselves of where we are, James is writing to believers who have been scattered in a place that is not their home. They've been in, sent out in the nations, nations that reject the Lord, nations that are hostile to Christianity, to cultures that are depraved and ungodly. And James writes to them, and he's writing this letter thinking, what is, the, what is the thing they need most in the midst of that? He says, what he needs, what you need to know, is you need to focus on the growing and maturing in the faith for the glory of Christ. And so James gave his, 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 his people a series of tests. He gives us a series of tests to see, are you growing? Are you seeking maturity? Do you have true faith, or are you just fooling yourself, believing in facts, but not living in accord with what you say you believe. And so James wants believers to see if they're bearing the fruit of good works. If they're claiming to have faith, it should show by the things they do in their life. And so he gives these tests to look at the evidence of true salvation, the evidence of living faith, not the cause, the evidence of living faith. Faith. And this evidence is shown in the good works or good fruit that it produces in the one, how one conducts his life. We've seen that it endures trials. We've seen it resist temptation. We've seen that when one hears the word, it seeks to obey it, doesn't let it go in one ear and out the other. We see that there's a care for the helpless, the needy, the poor. We've seen that it also doesn't show partiality. And we saw justification. One is justified by its deeds, by its works, not by standing right in heaven, not by earning righteousness and acceptance into God, but justification in the courtroom of human opinion. 
One is accepted, one is declared righteous, we can say, by faith in Christ alone. By grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. But the fruit of the good works is going to be shown. And so in the court of public opinion, we can say, vindicated when we see the fruit of good works. In other words, living faith. So faith without works is dead, right? You can't have a dead faith that doesn't produce good fruit. And so what James is wanting us to see is one of the works that we are called to do is to produce a controlled speech. It is the fruit of living faith, a controlled speech. So James began last time, we saw, by warning teachers, by saying, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, because there will be a stricter judgment. In other words, teachers, their primary instrument in how they teach is through their tongue. And because we all slip in tongues at times, because we all stumble in many ways, you should be very careful before you pursue the office of teacher. There is stricter judgment. God holds us accountable for the things we say, especially teachers who are calling to proclaim the word of the Lord. And so there's warning. A teacher's judge with greater strictness. For the Christian, that's not in light of, will you be in heaven or not? Will you face eternal judgment? No, we, as we said, for the Christian, it's, it's a judgment that we will stand and give an account for our deeds, but it's out of reward. God will graciously reward those who do a job well done. But for those who occupy the office of teacher, who deliberately bring in error, who, bring, who are false teachers, they will stand before God, and it will be a strict judgment as well, but not in the merit of reward, but in the merit of eternal damnation. So he wants us to understand, be warned. Don't pursue the office of teacher because of our, our tongues, because we're so quick to stumble. But James wants us to say this isn't limited to teachers. He broadens his out now for us to say it includes every single one of us. If you have a tongue, this includes you. He bronzes it out to apply it. And the big idea he wants us to see is because we have been redeemed, we're now called to guard our tongue for the glory of Christ, knowing the power and damage it can cause. So we're going to see this in three keys, three ways, three ways we can see how we can guard our tongue. First, understand it's a mark of maturity, a mark of maturity. Second, understand the power of the tongue. And then third, Understand the danger our tongues can produce. Let's first consider the mark of maturity. Look again at verse 2. He says, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Now, we looked at that in depth a bit last time as well, but just to remind ourselves, notice he is saying, We all stumble. Notice he's including himself. Before, throughout the rest of this passage, he's using... You, you, you. Now he says, we. He recognizes he is a teacher, and even as a teacher, he stumbles in many ways. We all stumble. This is a comprehensive statement of the depravity of humanity. We all fall short of the glory of God, don't we? And one of the chief ways in which we do, and where that's seen, is in our tongue. The word for stumbling means to offend, and it's also used to describe sin. We all sin in many ways. We all need to be warned. And James isn't saying, hey, I expect your readers to be perfect and sinless. And he's giving us a lot of good things we should do, a lot of fruit that we should exhibit. But he understands, I'm not demanding perfection here. There should be progress, and this is sanctification. We will fail at times. But is the progress of your life one of growth and sanctification? So he understands, we are not perfect. We are not sinless. And this is why he gives the warning to teachers, but caution for us as well. We need to understand we all fail in many ways. James is understanding here, I'm not pretending as a teacher to have it all together. I'm just like you, he says. We all stumble. We all sin, me included. He's not saying this in a way to kind of minimize, right? Sometimes we can... We can uh, sin, or we do something that's wrong, and we said, well, we all sin. We're all sinners. We all stumble in many ways. Is it really that big of a deal? He's not doing it that way. What James is saying here is he's not minimizing it 
but he's humbly aware of his own failings and stumblings in light of his tongue. In fact, James understands, remember in chapter 2, verse 10, he says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. Right? He upholds the law. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become guilty of it all. James recognizes he stumbles. We all stumble in many ways. We have all become guilty of breaking the law. Because even I stumble in my tongue. And so here he is aware of the difficulty, aware of how easy it is to stumble. And in humility, he's recognizing that and being transparent. And he writes this, probably recalling some of his past stumblings. We can speculate a ton, but just a few things you can think of in Mark 3.21. Maybe there's been times when he responded in anger. Maybe there's been times when he responded in maybe tearing someone down or or cursing or whatever that might be. And he's thinking of that. It's like we all stumble. Primarily, he's the half-brother of Jesus. He grew up with Jesus. Imagine maybe some of the words he said to his sibling. Kids, imagine some of the words you say to your own siblings. And James being aware of this, knowing now his one of his his half-brother Jesus is the, his Savior. Think of the, the shame that he's feeling knowing some of the words he used to maybe even tear down his own brother. In fact, in Mark 3, 21, Jesus is in his hometown. He's casting out demons. And what happens? His family heard of it, James included. They went out to seize him and are saying, he's out of his mind. In other words, Jesus You're crazy. You're embarrassing us. Stop it. Words tear down. Especially those from family. Scarring. And maybe James is remembering this, how he used his words at one time to tear down his brother, to diminish his work, and he goes, we all stumble. We all stumble in many ways. And we would do well to recognize that. We all stumble to humbly admit it, to when we fall, to confess it, to own when we don't bring glory to God with our words. So can you say along with James, yeah, we we all stumble in many ways, me included. But also know that in Christ, we have forgiveness. There is forgiveness and there is grace and we are enabled to grow by virtue of the Holy Spirit in us. And so he says, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. So there's no way in which anyone does not stumble. There's no mere perfect man. This is true of all of us. And one of the ways in which we all stumble is in the control of our tongue. Now, as we grow up, the stages of human life, we have kind of measures in which we can gauge if someone's mature or not, right? Have you ever noticed when kids are young? They say kind of whatever comes to their mind. There's a show called Kids Say the Darndest Things, which is all about those kind of things. But there are many times in which kids may say whatever comes to their mind without thinking about the impact that might cause, right? And sometimes as parents, you have to say, hey, that's rude. We don't say that. That's not nice. And as children grow, they begin to have a filter. They begin to understand, I can't just say everything that comes to my mind. And as we notice that, we see, okay, they're growing up. They're maturing, right? And so in a similar way, James is saying, as we have that mark for physical maturity, the same is true spiritually mature, for spiritually maturity. We have been freed from the penalty of sin. Yes, by, and we have union with Christ. We have been saved, but now we are being saved from the power of sin, in our lives. This is sanctification. And one of the marks of that, of maturity, on how well you are growing and progressing in sanctification, he says, one of the marks is your speech. Notice again, he says, if anyone doesn't stumble, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. So the speech is a measure of spiritual maturity. This word for perfect has two senses. 
right? It has two senses that are possible, and James has actually used both in his book so far. The first sense you can think of without air, like perfect, without air, flawless, right? And James uses it that way in James 1.25 in light of the law. Anyone who looks at the perfect law, right, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer, one who forgets, but a doer, he will be blessed in his doing. He's saying the law is absolutely flawless. It's perfect. That's the standard God has. That's the law. But another sense can also be, uh, this word for perfect can also be translated as to be mature. And he uses that in James 1, 2, 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, unless steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect. You may be mature. So he's not saying, hey, these trials of suffering come into your life so that you can be flawless in this life, so you can achieve Christian perfectionism. No, rather he's saying, these trials come in your life, and what they're doing is they're refining you. And as they refine you, what they're doing is they're making you more and more mature into the image of Christ. Now, we can't be completely dogmatic and say, what sense is he using it here? Because I think both senses can be rightly applied. If it were the first sense, we can say in a flawless sense, he can say, if a man never stumbles his words, he would be a perfect man. In other words, no one's perfect. We all stumble. That'd be true, right? But Christ is perfect. He's the perfect man. Look at him. But the second sense, it says, if he does not stumble with his mouth, then he is a perfect or a mature man. In other words, as you reach spiritual maturity, you're able to guard your tongue more and more by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And I think that goes a little bit better with the context here. Only spiritual mature people can control their tongue. And James' point here is to say, a mark of spiritual maturity is, are you able to guard your tongue? To the greater degree that you're conformed to the image of Christ, the better you'll be able to have control over your tongue. Now, you'll never fully control it in this life because we all still are tainted with the flesh, the sinful flesh, but those who can control their speech are on the way to spiritual maturity. They're being conformed. There should be progress. And I I think that's what James wants us to see here. And this point is, this is a virtue you should desire. Does that describe you? Though we still have that remaining flesh in our lives, though we still stumble in many ways, still guarding our tongue, controlling our tongue should be an aim. Calvin said the taming of the tongue is the chief virtue to be desired. Because that's one of the hardest things to do. And James is going to bring that out for us. And so one of the ways we measure spiritual maturity, conformity to Christ, is by our speech, by how one uses their words. So we have a responsibility, James is bringing out, to to take care in this, to be diligent, to be watching over what comes out of our mouths. Psalm 39 said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I'll guard it with a muzzle. The psalmist would so much rather give God the glory than have something spew out of his mouth that makes him boast in himself or tear down others and doesn't give glory to the Lord. Now, we shouldn't hear that and say, okay, James, so I need to have control over my tongue. Okay, Uh, that's good and wise. That's, That's good. But we shouldn't think, okay, well, if I just obey these do's and don'ts, maybe if I just, if I just minimize this command to these two things, I'm not going to say cuss words, and I'm not going to say anything that's not nice. If you don't have something that's not nice, don't say anything at all, right? Okay, I'm not doing those things, James, so I've achieved spiritual maturity. And he's saying, no, that's, that's, that's missing the whole point. Don't fool yourself just by thinking, applying these things you don't do as a check mark for maturity. When James is saying guard the tongue, it should be a reflection of what's in the heart. I have some friends who, uh, they have some kids, and one of them I teach tennis. And uh, they were telling me about how they're trying to teach their kids to 
uh, have, to have a guarded tongue, to be careful in what they say. And so the kid, they tell the kids, one thing we don't say is we don't say shut up because that is very rude and it can be offensive to people and it's hurtful. So knowing this, they still want to get that out, right? So they become creative. And I had one of the boys that I was teaching, his sister was on the other side of the fence and nagging him. And he was just getting frustrated and frustrated. You could see it. He was wanting to say it, but he knew he couldn't. And so he says, silence, you heathen. (laughs) He was careful in what he said, but he wasn't guarding his tongue. He wasn't, it still came out what he wanted to say. In a similar way, James is not saying, just avoid the bad words and don't, if, if, if not, if it's not nice, don't say it. He's not just saying, just do that. He's saying, rather, if, if you have grace in your life by virtue of what Christ has given you, let that be evident in the way you speak. Ephesians 4 says this, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion that you may have grace, give grace to those who hear. So there's a bad use of the tongue and there's a a good use of the tongue that James is trying to bring out. If you're being confronted and conformed to the image of Christ, you can't just say whatever comes to your mind. You can't be speaking words of flattery or crude joking or blaspheming or gossip or tearing down in anger. But rather, the fruit of the Spirit is speaking words that come and flow out of grace. And yes, sometimes that means not saying anything at all. And that takes discernment to know how and when to speak. But let's not minimize it into just a bunch of do's and don'ts, but let it be an outflow of the inward reality. And when you recognize who you are in Christ, the grace that you have been given, you want to speak that kind of grace and truth into other people's life. And the fruit of the Spirit is that of self-control, and it should be reflected in how we speak, in the words we say. It's a measure of spiritual maturity. Notice he says, if he doesn't stumble, he's a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. This word for bridle means to control, and we'll get into this a little bit more. But the implication here is the tongue is the hardest member of your whole body. Though it's small, it's the most difficult to control. The tongue has a strong influence. It's been said, control your tongue or it will be controlling you. You can even say the direction that your tongue goes is the direction your life will go. The tongue is an outward expression of the heart. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we could restrain our bodies so much, but the tongue is just simply unrestrained. It's easy to just have whatever comes to mind flow out. So if you experience regeneration, if you're growing as a Christian, your speech ought to be different. Have you ever noticed whenever you have maybe someone from a different country come and they have an accent, you know, you can tell you're not from here, are you? Right? They could even maybe even um, be a citizen of the United States, but they, you, you hear that accent and it says, you know, as, as I told uh, Peter, your accent gives you away. We know you're not from here. And James is saying, you're, you're now a citizen of heaven. And your speech should reflect that who you're a citizen of. It should reflect your home country. Not saying you must have a particular accent, but what it's saying is your speech should be a a witness to who you belong to. It should be evident. You shouldn't be blending in to a culture that hates God and speaking just like them. So if you've experienced regeneration as a Christian, that's your aim, that's your goal, is to pursue this and our speech is a litmus test of our heart. James 1.26 says, If anyone thinks he's religious and doesn't bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person religion is worthless. In other words, your speech reflects your true nature. You can't say you believe in, in good, uh, solid gospel things and then go out and speak blasphemy, go out and tear down your neighbor, go out and gossip, go out and slander, go out and do whatever it takes to influence someone in a bad way. His point is the tongue, though small, it has a great power to influence, has a great power to lead in good or also in bad. But the aim should be 
control your tongue. Now he wants to give us an illustration, several illustrations actually, of the power of the tongue. Look at verse 3. If we put bits into the mouth of horses so that they obey us, we guide the whole bo- their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder. Wherever the will of the pilot directs, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. So James doesn't just tell us about the power the tongue has. He gives you examples. And he's a, he's a good teacher. Teachers want to illustrate their points. They, here is what I want you to get, right? And then he says, let me give you an illustration of that. Jesus did this quite a bit. He would give a command, and then he would give a, a parable or an illustration explaining this. And following in good suit of his half-brother, James now gives us some powerful illustrations. And the illustrations are to convey the point Though being small, it's powerful to do great things. First illustration is a bit of a horse's mouth. So horses, they put on bridles. It's a headpiece in which in, in their, on their headpiece, there would be a piece that connects to their mouth, which would have a bit. And the bit would be, be a metal bit that's placed against their tongue. And a rider can completely control where the horse goes just by pulling that bridle, which activates the bit. It can control the entire body of that horse with this little tiny metal bit. And if you're familiar with horses, surely you can appreciate this illustration that James is giving here. If you've ever been around them, you notice how big and strong they are, how muscular, how, how much more powerful they are than us. Right? We, we actually un, all have an understanding of the power that is behind a horse. Right? We measure things in what? Horsepower. Right? And so these, these are things that we can see the strength of a horse, and, and yet a single bit can control the entire body of a horse. It's been said that a horse can pull three times its own weight, which means it can, it can pull up to 2,500 pounds or more. And farmers, recognizing this, wanted to harness this kind of power, and so they put bits in the mouth of the horses to have them do what they wanted, to plow a field. Contrary to popular belief, uh, I don't know if it's popular belief, but horses don't do that willingly. right? They would just run around. But here, a bit would control the whole horse. And if they're able to control it with a tiny bit, they're able to control the whole body. When I was a kid, I got a chance to ride a horse, and I remember the instructor saying, okay, pull the reins this way if you want to go that way, pull the reins this way if you want to go that way, if you want the brakes, just pull back. And I've never ridden a horse, and I was maybe 70 pounds at the time. You have this 1,000-pound horse. I'm less than a tenth of the size, yet I was able to make it go where I wanted it to go because of the tiny bit. The tiny bit of the whole controls the whole body. No matter the size of the rider, they can control this horse. And James's point is, though it's small, it has a powerful ability to control. And the same is with your tongue. If you can control it, you can control your whole body. He gives another example, and it's that of ships. He says, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. James points to the great sea. And the Jews being on on the Sea of Galilee were very familiar with the sea. And actually, actually they feared the power of the sea. Much less uh, having these big ships. And in Acts 27, it says that these kind of ships could carry up to 270 passengers and tons of cargo. Yet these big ships, no matter the winds and the waves, a pilot can direct it by a small rudder, through the waves, through the winds, where it wills. The rudder's tiny. And these days you can look into the strait and see how much bigger ships we have. And the principle is the same. Though they're big and mighty, though there might be wind and waves, it's that small rudder that directs the entire ship. And James is saying, just like that tiny rudder has the power to control the whole ship, so too your tiny tongue directs your whole body. It directs your whole life. Understand the power that your tongue has. 
And so the little words we say, which might seem minuscule in the moment, might seem like small things, don't underestimate the power of your tongue. The tongue has the power to influence who we are. Implication, you need to try to control it or else it would control you. A godly Christian discipline is to cultivate the control of the tongue. But James' point is this is extremely difficult. But as you seek God, you seek for grace and power for him to help you control your tongue. It's possible. With your own strength, it's impossible. You need to rely on the grace of God for this. So we see his illustrations. He says, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. So just as the will of the rider is able to control the horse with the bit, just as the captain can control the whole ship with a tiny little rudder, so too the influence of our tongue directs our entire life. How are you using your tongue? Notice it says, yet boast of great things. There is, not all boasting is bad, right? There is cause for good boasting, and you boast in the Lord, and there is cause for bad boasting, and the tongue is capable of doing both. The tongue can do great things. Its power is disproportionate to its size. Proverbs 18.21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So self-controlled tongue can do great things for the glory of God, but an uncontrolled tongue can do great harm. Proverbs 10, 11, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Or Proverbs 25, 11, a word filthy, fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. If the bit isn't in the mouth of the horse, you can't control the horse. If the rudder isn't functioning, you can't control the ship. It's going to lead to shipwreck. And in the same way, if you can't control the tongue, it's going to influence for bad. It's going to control your whole body and do great damage. The tongue, though tiny, has tremendous power. So our speech can be used for good. We can speak words of grace. We can build up. We can speak words of healing. We can encourage We can speak truth and grace and love, or our speech can be used for bad. Foolish and sensitive words can lead to division, ruining of relationships. Marriage, words can leave scars and do great damage. They can cut deep. Just mentioning the word divorce to your spouse can do great harm. Avoid saying that. Words we say to our children can have lasting effects on their relationship. Do you recognize the power of your tongue to lead in a good way or to lead in a a bad way? And James wants us to say, control your speech. It ought to reflect who you are in Christ. But not only are you to know the power of the tongue, you should also understand the destructive danger. Look with me at verse 5, the second half. How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, set on fire by hell. James now wants to give an illustration about the danger of an unbridled tongue, a tongue that is not controlled. And he gives a fascinating illustration with a forest fire. We're all familiar with forest fires. They can be deadly. They can be do a lot of damage. Not long ago, I was coming back from preaching in Wyoming, and I was driving in the eastern side of the state, and it's very arid, and there was thunderstorms. And there was a lightning strike that started a fire, and you can just start to see the cloud get bigger and bigger and bigger. And as I got near it, you can start to see flames, and it was getting close to the highway where I was. You can see the embers jumping from tree to tree, and as it went, it would just ignite. And it was fueled by winds. And it was very scary, to say the least. I was able to make it through before the fire jumped the street. But it was dangerous. It was scary to see just how fast a spark, a lightning strike, could start such a big fire. 
He's saying that's, that's just like your tongue. Your tongue is like that little fire. But it can expand. It can create great destruction. It starts small, but it can grow out of control and do unfathomable damage. Living in Southern California, we really understood the reality of this. Um, when I was in seminary, we didn't have snow days. We had fire days. And uh, I remember there was a couple times when we had to cancel school because the smoke was right there. There was one time I actually saw a cloud, and I could see it from our apartment window. It was just north of Escondido. And what happened was there was a big, massive fire that was being fueled by what they call Santa Ana winds. And these winds are super strong and powerful, and they just feed the fire. And this area is very arid, very much like what Jerusalem is like these days. And so the people in Jerusalem could understand James' analogy very, very well. They were a culture that, was, that emphasized farming. So they understood the amount of damage one small little spark could do to their entire year's crops, to their livelihood. And I remember seeing from my apartment that fire spread and in a day go about a thousand acres because of the Santa Ana winds. And to, and then it came about how it started. I remember, even remember there were firefighters who died in that fire. And as I went through the highway, they had this American flag afterwards that was a memorial to them. But it was a testimony to the amount of damage that that fire caused. Livelihoods were ruined. Lives were lost. And how it started was just crazy to think about. Someone wanted to take a phone call while they were on the highway. So they pulled over the side of the road into tall grass, and the heat of the engine ignited the grass. With the winds, it fanned a massive fire. One small spark, massive blaze ensued. So forest fires are massive. They are destructive, and they start, though, very small. It could be a cigarette bud that goes out. It could be a campfire that's not fully extinguished. It could be that lightning strike or just the car that stops over that's a little too hot. It starts tiny, but James's point is it multiplies, it grows, it ignites an entire forest ablaze, causing great destruction and death in its past. And, and James is saying, that's what your tongue's like. That's what your tongue's like when it's unguarded, when that one little careless word goes out. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. One little misplaced word can set ablaze a fire. It can have drastic effects. The tongue, though small, can cause unthinkable damage. Proverbs 16.27 says, The worthless man plots evil, and his speech is like a scorching fire. Using an unbridled tongue, having uncontrolled words is like playing with fire in a straw field. God will judge those who start fires. Notice what else he describes this as, a world of unrighteousness. So despite being small, despite being a fire, it's a world of unrighteousness. Or another way you can translate this is a cosmos of iniquity. This word for cosmos isn't referring to the physical, literal world, the earth, but a system, a system of unrighteousness, a system of evil. And the tongue is the command center of the unrighteousness of man. We saw that last week in Romans, where it talks about there's none righteous, no, not one. It talked about the depravity, right? And it says the venom of asp is in their mouth. It's a deadly poison. There was a world of unrighteousness right in your mouth. John MacArthur said this, There's no bodily part that has such far-reaching potential for disaster as the tongue. It is a network that breeds evil. John Calvin said, Such a tender portion of flesh contains the whole world of iniquity. It is a world of unrighteousness left unchecked left unguarded. Notice what else it says. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body. 
So this one small body part that we have, if it's left unguarded, unchecked, stains the whole body. When you speak one uncontrolled word, it has a staining effect. This word for stain means to defile or to make corrupt. And James is playing off his analogy of the fire. The tongue is a fire, but whatever it doesn't burn, it's going to stain. It's going to affect it. I enjoy going on hikes every once in a while, and when I was out there, sometimes I'll go through these sections of forests that have been scorched by fires. And whatever doesn't burn from the fire, you can see, especially like on the mountainside with a rock, has been stained by the smoke. Not long ago, we were looking at houses, and one time I went into a house, that uh, a house of a smoker. The house looked great, and then you looked up. You see, it's all stained yellow-brown, and it smelled that way, too. It had its discolored because of the constant smoke. And James is saying, that's what your tongue is like. When you speak, it pollutes your whole body. It stains you. You can't just wash your mouth out with soap. It stains your body. No matter the amount of washing you do, you can't get rid of it. And Jesus brings this out in Matthew 15. In Matthew 15, you, you, you remember this. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees who are, who are all about, oh, your disciples are eating with unwashed hands. That's defiling them. And what does Jesus say? It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. In light of the world of unrighteousness that the tongue is, listen to this. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. MacArthur added, the tongue is a raging fire, and what it can't consume, it will stain with a pitchard's foul smoke. The tongue is the part of the body that has the potential to stain our whole person if left unchecked. Notice what else it says, setting on fire the entire course of life, literally the entire wheel of life or the circle of life. In other words, it's not just going to impact you here in the moment. It can, it can impact your entire life. And not just you personally, but those around you. I've counseled people before whose entire life was ruined because of some bad words that they've said. Unwise words that they said to a spouse. And that didn't just affect him and his relationship to his spouse, that affected the entire family. That infected, infected the, 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 all the friends, too, who now had an idea of what happened. The tongue can do lasting damage. It can affect, it can set on fire the entire course of your life. What do your words say about you? How do people know you by your words? Notice what else. And set on fire by hell. This word for hell here is interesting. It's the word Gehenna. And it recalls back to Jeremiah. If you're familiar with Jeremiah, he, he, he was talking about the Valley of Slaughter. Now, this is a very real, literal valley. And it was a valley that was condemned in Jeremiah's day because child sacrifices happened there to Baal and Malak. What was happening there is the bodies of children were being offered and burned. You can read about it in 2 Chronicles 28, Jeremiah 7 and 19, and then 2 Kings 23. And so Jeremiah comes and he speaks on God's behalf and brings judgment because of the deeds. These deeds were an abomination in God's sight. And so he brings judgment on this valley. Well, when Jesus comes, we see this valley once again. And what is it? It's a burning heap of garbage. It's a garbage dump. And it's a picture of hell that God will judge sin. And James is saying, that's the sin that sets your tongue on fire. It comes from hell. This is why Jesus told the Pharisees, 
You're of the, your father, the devil. You're speaking his words. When the tongue is uncontrolled, it spews out hate, anger, gossip. It's fueled by the very fires of hell. So may we ever be aware of the destructive power and the danger of the tongue. So as we close, do you desire the mark of maturity in a controlled tongue? Do you see that your words have power for good or for bad? What are you using your words for? Do not overlook the damage that can happen, that little words, seemingly little insignificant words can cause. What marks your tongue? Is your tongue marked by carefulness, by grace, by truth, or is it filled with gossip, hate, and filth? We're easily to be quick to grumble. We're easily quick to complain and to let everyone around us know, to tell people what we really think when we're wronged, without considering the damage it can cause. It's far too easy to stumble in our speech, and that's what James is wanting us to see. Maybe you're on your way to church today and you said something in the car that you regret. We all stumble in many ways. We all have slips of tongue. The thing is, for the believer, there's forgiveness, there's grace. And when we confess our sins to God and to one another, there's comfort. So know there is forgiveness. Jesus has saved you exactly from these sins your past, present, and future sins of your mouth. This isn't a call to just say, okay, harness your tongue with your own strength. Just do better, try harder. If you're talking bad, just stop it. That's just law. And James is going to go back next week, and he's actually going to say, in your own strength, it's impossible. You you can't do this. You can can tame all these other animals, but you're not going to be able to tame the tongue. But with God, it's possible. You need his grace. And as you look to him, you're motivated to do these things out of love and gratitude for what he has done for you. And just consider Jesus. He was our perfect one, not only a perfect teacher, but our perfect representative who came specifically to redeem us, who was born under the law, and he perfectly fulfilled it, but he suffered, he was mistreated, he had every reason to tear down people, but he didn't. He had every reason to shut them up with his words. He had every reason to call names. Every reason to grumble and complain because he was mistreated, yet he opened not his mouth. He was our perfect representative who never stumbled with his tongue. First Peter say, says this, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And he prayed the price for our failures, for our stumblings of the tongue, so that we can be redeemed. And in Christ, he has regenerated you. He has given you new life. He has given you his spirit. He has given you the ability to control your tongue. As you look to him, as you rest on what he has done, he's given you a motivation And now you're to see all the work that he's done for you. And out of love and gratitude, you look to him and you want your speech to be pleasing to him. And that's what James is going to bring us to. 1 Peter 2.24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, right, including the sins of our tongue. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So when we stumble in our tongues, may we be quick to seek forgiveness, confess it to the Lord, remember what he's done for you to pay for that very sin, and then out of love and gratitude, seek to glorify him with your speech. And one of the greatest honors we have to glorify him with our tongue is to sing praises of love and thanksgiving to him. So we may, may we be those who seek to grow in maturity, who seek to guard our tongues for what Christ has done for us. So because we've been redeemed, we're called now to guard our tongues for the glory of Christ, knowing the power and the damage it could cause. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
when we hear sermons like this, it's, it's far too easy to just beat ourselves up, to see our failings, and to just try to tell ourselves, do better, try harder. Lord, help us fully to look to Jesus, to see him as our perfect one, who never stumbled in tongue, who perfectly spoke words of life, and who did what was loving, even when he talked to people and confronted Pharisees, he spoke the truth out of love. Lord, help us to not only cherish what he's done and seek to glorify God with our tongue, but also seek to also speak the truth in love because of what he's done for us, our perfect model as well. So Lord, we thank you for your word and we want to live in accord. Lord, we pray by the power of your spirit, you would grow us you would help us mature, spiritually speaking, so we can guard our tongue and give you all the glory for the words we say. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.